Oh my god, you guys, we're like playing Pillars of Eternity and like we're gonna start talking about the salty fucking mast and the awakened wood. Okay, like I don't even know how to handle that shit. <laughs> so just is fine. <laughs> okay, I just was laughing, so I'm gonna have to post that sound test for sure. <coughs> Also, I've been like randomly sneezing and coughing all day, yeah. so. But as bad as last night. What are we doing? Oh, yeah. We're in the tavern, not the salty mast. We are in. Like, the sure. merchant y uh, thespian one. Who are you? A woman sits by herself, spinning something on the table in front of her and watching it with ferocious intensity. It's about the size of the coin, and it wobbles over a crack in the wind with a metallic rattle. She snatches it up with one hand and slams a half-empty cup down on the table with the other. This is not a good time. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> you look like you could use another drink. <laughs> I'll get there. She takes a long drink from her glass, just trying to calm down and trying to talk myself out of something foolish. <laughs> I'll be going. <laughs> something foolish. She says nothing for a few moments as if hoping you'll leave. At last, Kainra looks at, at you. The lamplight falls across her face. A purpling bruise is blossoming along her cheekbone. There's something I need to give to my fiancé, Pernisk. Only he doesn't seem to go anywhere with his without his new friends, and they're not exactly pleasant company. Tell me about these new friends. They come into our house with their dead eyes and their black teeth. I'm not a fool. I know what it means. Pernisk makes me leave when they show up, but it's obvious what they come to do. Last time they came, I told them to get out. Let them have their fun somewhere else in the gift. I'm still not sure about that one. <laughs> But not under my roof. She scowls and then winces, her fingertips gently probing her bruise. Zveph changes you, changes you, I guess. Oh, okay, so that's like a drug of some sort. I was wondering that from uh, last night conversation with the bartender. The Pernis, the Pernsk I knew wouldn't have squashed a spider. I never thought he'd. She trails off, still feeling the swollen, discolored flesh. Uh, well, let's find out about it first. I don't see the joke, she eyes you suspiciously. You really don't know? It's a shrub, I think, from out in the mountains somewhere. It has dark berries and they treat them somehow. Makes the pulpy paste. You rub it into your gums and you're supposed to see, I don't know, amazing things. Your own soul, people who use it. That's all they do. They lay around seeing things for days. Um, okay. You got to the crucible night to tell them my fiance hit me she shakes her head they'll just tell me to stay away from him they've got too many other problems to worry about a domestic dispute okay i can go talk to him her hand rests on the table as she clenches it into a white knuckled fist there's nothing more to say to him we're finished i just want to give this back to him and have a clean break she opens her hand and ring clatters onto the table it was his grandmother's even after this i don't have the heart to sell it off but if I go back there, I'll know what'll happen. I'll lose my temper and I'll probably wind up with another one of these, she points to her bruise. Uh, I'll take it to him then. She looks at you and nods. The house is just north of here. Just please don't hurt him. As furious as I am, I, I don't want that on my conscience. Eh? Eh? philosophy on the other side of the curtain. Are you sure that's what they're doing? Hate to say it, but legacy's been good for business. What are you talking about? You've come to talk some sense into this fellow, I hope. Brad Fur Furious. You see a mud-soaked clearing, rain falling to the ground in large drops. This man is lying on his back in the muck. His hands holding open the mob, an enormous stagler that stands over him, his front paws on his chest. The heavy rain falls over them, playing counterpoint to the grunts made by the opponents. Dead stagler. 
Stelgar, sorry, litter the ground around him, and the man's body shows signs of a difficult battle. His clothing is torn, hanging in scraps in some places. Bites and scratches cover his arms and legs. A huge gash cuts across his forehead, blood and water mixing as they run down his face and drip into the mud. It takes all the man's effort to keep the beast's jaws from clamping down. Oh, goodness. The man looks around wildly until his gaze finally lands on a large axe, barely within arm's reach behind his head, the rain slowly covering it with grime and muddy water. He looks at the st Stelgar, sorry, and then back at his axe, grim determination in his face. His arms are shaking, and it seems he will not be able to hold the beast back for much longer. He takes a deep breath and wraps his right hand around the Stelgar's bottom jaw. Then he lets go with his he left hand, freeing the top of his head. The Stelgar's mouth snaps shut on his right hand as his left shoots out above his head and grabs a handle of the axe. The Stelgar grinds his teeth and pulls back, trying to free itself from his grip, blood dripping from its mouth onto his face. With a grunt that quickly becomes a bellow of pain, the man pulls his right hand down, bringing the beast's head closer to him, swinging the axe around as he does. The blade of the weapon pierces the Stelgar's neck and it yelps, its mouth popping open as it tries to step backwards off the man. Before his mangled hand can lose its grip, the man pulls and twists as hard as he can, trying to get the beast on the ground. Using the Stelgar's resistance to pull himself into a sitting position, he brings the axe down on the neck again, its neck again, and again, and one final time as its head and hand simultaneously come free. The head flies from his grip as he thrusts his hand behind his back to brace himself as he falls. As his hand hits the ground and its full weight lands on it, a second bellow of pain erupts from his mouth. Breathing heavily, he brings his now mangled hand up to assess the damage. The little finger is gone, lost somewhere in the mud. The two fingers next to it are twisted, broken onto iron, barely attached to his hand by small bits of flesh. Dude, how do you not have, like, tetanus and rabies? He sighs, grabbing both dangling figures with the left hand. He grits and pulls, teeth and pulls you! I'm trying to see if he has, like, he said his right hand, right? That looks pretty full to me. Anyway, <laughs> um, as I was reading there, I was kind of thinking, oh, I'm kind of wondering what the purpose of these, like, little story times are. I don't know if it's just world building or, I mean, like, some of the stories are kind of just, like, you're like, okay, yeah, whatever, I can see why you did that. And other ones are like, wow, you're a dick. And I'm pretty sure you can target NPCs to attack, so I wonder if it's kind of like a dishonored kind of like uh, mechanic where um, you like hear what their thoughts are, or what they've done, little snippets, and then you like, oh my god, you're a I dick, I'm gonna kill the fuck out of you. Or, or you're done. like, oh, I can't uh, fault you for that or whatever. Ooh, a ring. I hope no one will mind if I stole the ring. No one was watching, so... I'm kind of a douche. It's fine. Um, there are some other dudes I could get the spec stories on. Yeah, these guys. So, who do we want to start with? We've got this uh, blue-robed guy. We've got this pink tunic guy. And we've got Flamey McFlamerson here. Irish D. Tungsten. Oh. We see a fire burning slowly on the side of a winding road, unmanned. There seems to be no fuel, no wood or oil for it to consume. No hay or twigs. Despite this roar, crackle... Despite this, it roars, crackles, wails in the wind. It takes you a moment, but you begin to notice a figure in the flames. Its shaking hands cradle a young face, molten red tears marring skin the color of the coal. The boy cowers, flame coating him as he holds his knees to his chest. In the distance, a man approaches, faceless. He extends a hand to the frightened child, who considered it warily before taking it. The flames died down, leaving his limbs and settling on his head like obedient pets. All tears dried, they walk together, fire and death, hand in hand. I'm guessing he's fire and the other guy's death. You see a wizard playing illusions in town square. Fingers plucking color and sound from the air and weaving scenes of beauty and fright. A crowd of onlookers gasp and cheers. Okay. Enthralled with that despair. Er, followed with the display, all but one boy standing off to the side, mouth agape, green eyes are pale with wonder, vision after vision playing out before him, and something inside the boy clicks. 
Without warning, he bolts, disappearing into the crowd, pushing and shoving desperately. The mage finishes his show soon after, a giant silver dragon descending through the crowd and a thousand stars exploding into nothingness. Collecting coins, he walks around the clapping crowd, bowing and nodding at each as he passes until a small sack is dropped into his hands. The boy stands for a moment before him, small and still, and begs the wizard to apprentice him. He glances at the hefty bag, weighing it, and the boy carefully. Finally, he nods and flicks gently at the bag, which disappears. The boy grins. How'd you do that? He asks, but the illusionist, illusionist merely winks. The vulture. You see a hand, curled and bruised, stake to the floor with a bent metal spike. Blood covers the floor and drips from the furnishings and the walls. The man looks up from the body he's crouched over to survey the carnage he caused to the family in whose house he now skulks. Four bodies at total, a woman, two men, and a girl. Lie blindfolded on the ground. Their legs are bound and both hands are attached to the floor with spikes. He has lifted the woman's blindfold and is currently doing something to her eyes. He pulls back a small blade and covers the eyes again, gently patting the blindfold. He stands and looks around, seemingly satisfied with his handiwork. Suddenly his breath quickens, hearing someone approach the door to the room. He bounces in place, excitement almost overwhelming him, then rushes to the back of the room, concealing himself in the shadows. From his vantage, he sees the bodies are perfectly arranged, each one facing the door, welcoming the man of the house back, arms outstretched as if in embrace. The door opens as he slowly pulls another spike from his belt, the tip of his tongue playing across his teeth in anticipation. You sound like a nice hmm. guy. Murder! So yeah, like stuff like that, like the other two guys, you're like, oh yeah, this is cool. And the other guy, you're like, oh, I want to kill you kind of thing. Key. Okay. Yeah. She might be a, a recruitable person, actually. Maybe not. Or these are guys that... We're gonna have to eh? chat with later. Two tone Wexel. God's key. Whoa. The Orland man relaxes with his feet propped on the table. Patches of dark brown skin peek out from under a full mane of blue green hair. He and the Orland woman with him exchange laughs and comments with the trio at a nearby table, and he spins a dagger in his hands. His hazel eyes watch you. You look like you have seen a night or two in the wilds joining us for a drink. Who are all of you? The name's Two-Tone Wexel. The lady next to me is Key. We've had our fun with the expeditions, but we're hoping to enjoy a little peace and quiet for the next few weeks anyway. The man at the next table nods to you. I'm Deadshot Dated. This is Herdy and Ilfa. We were part of the separate expedition teams, but we both suffered losses and decided to band together. He ticks several items off his fingers. Beasts, barbarians, beowax. It's a dangerous time to be an adventurer, but a prosperous one too. At the next table... Daedon raises his glass, and here's to many more prosperous journeys! Something else you wanted? No. Just... <sighs> Checking things out, man. This won't stop me for long. There! Done! There! Done! Ooh, more lockpicks. Excellent. I'll see what I can find. Is there anything good in here? I don't mind petty thievery. Get good shit out of it. We've we've got like some dangerous stuff in our in our future, man. Shanaglin. See a group of people standing in a clear path of earth, surrounded by several motionless bodies. On the ground in the middle of the group is a small figure curled up to protect itself from the kicking feet of the people standing around it. This woman is there, apart from the group, holding an enormous sword. She leans on it, using it almost like a crutch, hunched over and breathing heavily. She stares at the people and grunts, pulling herself upright and lifting the sword from the ground. She draws in a large breath, leans into a run, and quickly closes the distance between herself and the group. A blood-chilling howl suddenly explodes from her lips from her. Okay. The mob freezes mid-kick. It stares at the terrifying bull of a woman now charging it. She jumps at the last second, bending slightly, turning herself into a projectile flying into the middle of the people, assaulting the figure on the ground. Everyone topples as she flies into them. She hits the ground beyond them. She hit the ground running at the speed of light. 
or sound. I can't remember how the lyrics go. She hits the ground beyond them, rolling, leaping back up, and turns to face them. She plants both of her feet and lifts her sword, surveying the field. Suddenly, she spins on her heels, swinging her sword with savage grace, cutting down the nearest of the assailants. Letting herself get pulled into the momentum of the spin, she brings her sword all around. <laughs> Blade sideways. I was trying to say all around. It's just all around. <laughs> Blade sideways into the head of a would-be opponent. The bottom of the hilt shatters his temple. Ah... Uh... Shatters his temple and he crumples to the ground at her feet. One second. <laughs> Sorry, I just turned that off. I don't know if my internet died or something. Oh yeah, the internet totally died. I'll have to look into that later. She looks up, rage-filled eyes, daring the remaining two men to approach. After a quick sideways glance at each other, they turn, heel, and run. One briefly looks back over his shoulder, ensuring she isn't following him. She slowly sets out the breath she had she slowly lets out the breath she has been holding and walks over to help the figure still huddled on the ground. Put me out of my misery. Okay. Herod Raoul. <clears throat> you see a man standing on the dock. Sailors, soldiers, and prostitutes swarm all around him. I see, I did all around again! God damn it! But he's watching the ship disappearing over the horizon. He should be glad that his men didn't take his life along with the ship, but failure is almost as bad as a death for a Valayan. And the gods only know he hadn't fared any better in his family's mercantile business. It's almost a relief to see that last herald of his failure sailing into the distance. I keep adding words. Sp Sperry and letters. Sparing him the need to go back to his father and admit defeat once again. Besides, with sharp wits and an eye for opportunity, there's always a chance for a comeback. He pulls a flask from his hip and takes a long drink. There will be time for that later. He adjusts the flap of his eye patch and finds the tower of the brothel. He plots a new course for the evening, a grin on his face. Eh? Eh? I don't think anybody gets upset if I, like, pick the lock. But if I steal things, Why not? then they do. There. Done! I won't steal right in front of them. Not that. Uh, more. There's three of them in here. Hold on. I have to check this room first. Silent. Dang. Oh, wait. The most unfortunate tale of Favia and Bernat, a Valayan tragedy. I am kind of curious. Alright, let's go see what these guys are about. This won't stop I get experience there. for picking Done. locks. <laughs> eh, it's just gold. It's fine. Or copper or whatever. You see a firm hand scribbling notes from an ancient, surprisingly sturdy-looking tome. Script precise, picture small but clear. The monk runs his fingers across the paper lightly, page after page, searching for something. The script is ancient, almost illegible. But he pers perseveres, scrawling stacks and sheaves of notes. Sheaves. Transcribing the book into something more comprehensible. Suddenly, he starts scribbling hastily, eyes wild. Pan a blur across the newly ink spattered page. With a start, he pushes out from the desk and closes the tome, sending waves of dust to coast about the room. He grins wildly. Widely. He hurries to the exit, notes piled under his arm, and a new adventure on his mind. Lixcanium Macredge. You see a man pl praying soundlessly on the ground, lips moving to some ancient and noble hymn. Lying in his hands, his sword sputters into blinding white light, banishing the darkness around him t instantly to lurk in corners and shelves. He opens his eyes slowly, continuing his silent prayer as he adjusts to the new light, his face tight with concentration. He stands and begins to move deliberately towards an enormous iron door, strange symbols inscribed upon its rusted surface. His prayer gets louder, gains substance as he gets closer. Blue eyes burn with fervor as the glowing tip of the sword touches the center of the door. He s and slides through. White light spreads across its surface, symbols flaring into life as the paladin chants. A gentle tone sounds ringing through the ancient structure, and the door begins to open. The symbols have disappeared, along with rust, and the paladin steps through into places unknown, bearing a light he's only now beginning to understand. 
It'd be hilarious if, like, later on it's like, oh, yes, you have to go and deal with, like, all the people you found that were, like, of this type of story. And you're like, ah. Dash Oki? You see a grin slide across the face of a man and on the two... On... The face of a woman, younger it's still than he. She moves closer in the tallow light, sure and slow, tasting the anticipation on his tongue, the desire on hers. The candle gutters, sending yellow-brown light sneaking, sneaking across his multifaceted eyes. She sits back, now all too aware of the luminescent horns and dust-stamped blue skin. His otherness leaves her breathless, but from fascination or horror, you cannot tell. He reaches across a hand, trailing the line of her jaw, sibilant whispers sneaking through the air, tempting, cajoling. Something in her breaks, and his grin slides back as he extends his tongue to lick the curve of her throat. Ew. Pausing <laughs> hair's breath, breath from her flesh. The thing we spoke of, your husband. I shouldn't. He'd be ruined. A faint protest. The man wags his forefinger at her, tis tisking playfully, tracing a line with his finger down the length of her torso, causing her to writhe. He stops it just short. She gasps. No fair. That's that's cheating. She pouts childlike. Not if we make the rules. The man wings and he resumes his stroke. Eh? What are you doing? You're like just reading a plank of wood. No problem. Okay. Well, that was an adventure. Oh, the internet's back. I don't know what happened. Anyway, we've all had a rest. Bullshit! That's the first thing I saw. Oh boy. You see a man cross... You see a man crosses his arms and sticks his chin out. It should be a man cross his arms and sticks his... Whatever. Moonlight and torchlight color his face. Bullshit! The elf standing in front of him wears a panicked expression. Are you mad? I've seen it! Aha! The first man cries, raising a triumphant finger. You just said you only heard it! The elf blinks. What in the name of Galloween's beast does it have to do with anything? You said you'd only heard it. Now you're telling me it's a monster the size of two Omoa with blood-dried fur. The man takes a step closer to the elf. And now I'm saying you're a liar, Doran. Doran sputters. God's viscous. Who cares what it looks like? It's a rabid wolf. You saw what it did to the sheep. The elf throws up both of his hands, shaking his head. You want to stay out here all night and see this thing for yourself? Have it your way. I'm getting out of here. Fine. All right. Good. Elf storms off, casting one last glance over his shoulder as he disappears down a hill. <laughs> oh, the man sets off in the other direction, a sword in one hand and a torch in the other. Within minutes, he comes to a broken paddock where a dozen sheep lie dead, their throats torn and their innards scattered across the ground. It's not the work of a normal predator. Something crunches through the die, the die grass. The dry grass. <laughs> Viserys spins but sees nothing. He raises his torch higher. This time, a rustling sounds from behind him, near the paddock. He turns again to see a wolf. It's not nearly as large as Doran had sworn, and while its fur is matted with red around its throat and paws, the rest of the elf's description has proven to be a rather lurid exaggeration. Typical. This Viserys takes some small satisfaction in this, even while the wolf lunges for him, his jaws foaming and eyes rolling. I roll my eyes too whenever someone comes and kills and tries to kill me. He can't walk on the grass. Oh. That centers the screen. Psst, over here, miss! A young boy watches the passerby and counts a grimy handful of coins. His face and arms are smudged with dirt, but except for the grass stains, his clothes are in good condition. As you approach, he blinks and makes a quick furtive effort to pocket his coins. Hey, miss! Wanna know a secret? I don't know why he's like an old woman. He wipes his nose with his sleeve. I know a real good secret! Gordy. 
Looks like we got a little hustler here. Someone raised this kid right. <laughs> Really? What is it? <laughs> he shrugs and clasps his hands behind his back, kicking a loose pebble. I just saw some folks hiding some really neat things. I could show you where, but Mom and Dad told me not to talk to strangers. His eyes slowly roll up at you, but maybe you could help me with something. Then we wouldn't be strangers. Uh, with what? Gory's voice suddenly raises a pitch in tempo. The Crucible Knights have these daggers made out of marked steel. It's the best steel around, except for Durgan steel, which doesn't count because no one makes it anymore. He stops long enough to catch his breath. Anyway, there's a merchant over by the expedition hall, and he's a dagger made of real March steel. His eyes grow large and round. He said he wouldn't sell it to me because I'm a kid, and kids don't know anything about daggers. But that's not true. I know lots about daggers. I know about the different kinds of steel. I know how the Crucible Knights make them in the forge. I know that the tip can pierce low-gauge scale armor. <laughs> the one that's good and sharp enough to cut through bone. See, I know plenty about daggers. I really, really want this one. And if you could just get it for me, I promise I'll never, ever ask for anything, anyone anything again. I used to have a knife when I was his age. Don't know a better way to learn what you should and shouldn't stab. I say we give him a chance. <laughs> well, if 19 says it's okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's so mean. Sure, I'll get it for you. <laughs> Gertie jumps up and down, whooping and hollering. I know a real adventurer would understand. He points to the large building. There's a big merchant over there by Admeth's den who sells weapons. He's the one with the dagger. I'll wait right here for you. He grins ear to ear. The merchant's probably gonna be like, Yeah, that kid wants to, like, fight back against his abusive father. Or some shit like that. It's gonna be something, like, awful. It's so innocent. Until it's not. <laughs> okay. Gee, whiz, golly, wow. Mercenary, refugee. Sorry, I can't talk right now. The statuesque woman has a gaze like a cut stone. She turns her chiseled cheekbones to the sky and favors you with a look of acknowledgement. Her eyes shimmer under silvered eyeshadow and razor precise line of coal. Before you can speak, she throws her hand up in a dramatic How fashion. Do you do? Oh. Autographs after the performance plays. Great art requires great concentration. And greatness is expected from the revel of stars. What's the revel of stars? We are just, we are the finest theater troupe in the city. We believe that the best art is immersive and true to life. She looks at the amphitheater with rapturous expression. We stage our performances right here in Copper Lane for the edification of all. I suppose I can spare a moment for a fan. I just asked what the hell it was. She's like, I could spare a moment for a fan. If I'm like, if I was a fan, I'm sure I would have known about it. What do you do? It depends entirely on the demands of the role, she lays a slender hand on her chest. I'm the pallid knight, the widow of the wood, the warrior queen Mokga. At all at different times, to live a different life each day is a glorious thing indeed, my friend. Does the revel of stars take in any new numbers? But of course, good drama is a balm to the soul, and we wish to offer a true theatrical experience to as many as possible. Uh, what kind of members do you take? Well, we take in the new and, in the new and old, the tall and the small, the experienced and the inexperienced, whoever is best suited to fulfill a role to the utmost. How long do you keep members? As long as they're able to satisfy the demands of the roles. She smooths a wayward strand of hair. True acting can be a grueling process, so some last longer than others. I'd like to ask some other questions. I have none, so piss off. Sorry, I can't talk right now. Audience member. Less tame performances. I cannot die yet! My children! What of my children? But you have no children! Of course I do, you fool! A wealth of them! Great armfuls of gold and... 
That is golden haired tots, all of them who I love dearly. Ha! Ha! Ha ha! Oh, okay. The Stel Stelgar slain on rides mock guy, great hero of our tale. Though the road is long and fighting fierce, my courage will not fail. Her soul shines bright, her heart is true, but ahead lies greater dangers. Oh, cool. We have, like, an amphitheater, too. I wonder if we can, like, have, like, actors come and perform in my personal theater once I have it built. Everybody's smoking. Hey, man. <laughs> 